Good morning and welcome to St. James House of Prayer, whether you are here in the building or whether you are online joining us in worship, we are thankful for your presence. And just a couple of brief announcements. Uh, later this morning at 11 o'clock, um, those of you who are have access to email will uh, be able to, to receive our last stewardship sharing uh, talk for our fall stewardship recommitment. Um, Errol Kirk is the giver of that talk, and um, I know that I was blessed by it when I um, read it. In, I mean, when I listened to it in preview, so I commend that to you. Also, today we have a supply organist. Her name is Linnea Norsworthy, and we are grateful for her presence. Her husband Bernard is here with her, and so uh, we are thankful for her ministry of uh, leading us in worship. During the service, the folks in the building get to hum except for two musicians and We'll now begin with our opening hymn. Scriptures to be written for our learning, 
grant us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. First reading is taken from Judge. The Israelite again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after he who died. So the Lord sold them into the hands of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Horza. The commander of his army was Cicero, who lived in Persia. Then the Israelite cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and have oppressed the Israelites cruelly twenty years. At the time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lachadot, was judge of Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelite came up to her for judgment. She sent the son of Barak, son of Abelam, from Kedash in Nepal, and said to him, The Lord God of Israel commands you, Go, take possession of my favor. Bring in ten thousand from the tribe of Nephtal and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the water of Kishon, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 123 in unison, starting and ending with a refrain. Our eyes look to the Lord our God, from whom we seek mercy. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hands of their masters, and the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he show us his mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy, for we have had more than enough of contempt, too much of the scorn of the nibbling the rich and of the derision of the proud. Our eyes look to the Lord our God, from whom we seek mercy. Second reading is taken from the first Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the season, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourself know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is no peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, Sleep at night, and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in many things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given. They will have an abundance, but from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. As many of you know, I spent the four years before moving here in a dual ministry as the assistant rector of a parish and later a leader of that parish during the transition after that rector's retirement and the chaplain at a pre-K four through eighth grade school attached to the parish. One of the great challenges of my ordained ministry to this point, and one of the greatest joys, was to teach religion to all of those students from four years old to 12 or 13. My primary goal was not to get them to memorize Bible stories or to know the seasons of the church year. It was to guide them in exploring their relationship with God on their own terms so that they could develop a faith that was truly their own. My younger students would ask questions like, who made God? And where did God come from? But as they got older, they began to ask different questions, such as when a third grader said, so we call God Father and he, is God a boy? Needless to say, I had to answer such questions or help them to answer them. And since I wanted to be sure that they think about certain things, I would ask them a lot of questions too. I'd have them draw pictures of something that reminded them of God in terms of sight, sound, 
smell, touch, taste, and what God's love brought to their minds. Lots of sunsets and rainbows, gurgling streams or ocean waves, flowers or apple pie, teddy bears or blankets or a warm bath, pizza or candy or ice cream, and then a parent's embrace or a cuddly kitten or an excited puppy. And so we talk about why God reminds them of such things, and then that God is so much bigger. And in middle school, we would talk about what God, assuming that there is one, since I started the year by leaving even that question an open one, would be what that God must be like, infinite and unlimited in a variety of ways. And I asked about how they imagined God. And of course, I got a fair number of variations on an old man with a beard. They knew that art is full of such representations, which is probably where they got that image. But then they began to understand that that old man with a beard is limited. After all, he has to shave sometime, unlike God. And that the personality of the God imagined in this way might very well depend on what kind of relationship they have had with grandfathers or others whose appearance might fit the profile of the old man with the beard. So God and the way God acts would lie somewhere along the spectrum of harsh, angry, unwilling even to try to understand the lives of their children or grandchildren, especially in middle school, or on the other hand to indulgent, perhaps a bit forgetful, and also unable to understand the lives of their children or grandchildren, especially in middle school. Often this line of reflection would bring up some things in the lives of a few of the students that would lead to private pastoral conversations later. Of course, I did mostly hear some amazing descriptions from these students of elders in, that indicated a relationship that is close, trusting, loving, respectful. But even those students would find it enlightening that God doesn't have whatever limitations they perceive in their elders. What does it mean to be a truly unlimited being? Today's gospel reading, usually called the parable of the talents because talent is the traditional name of the coins entrusted to the three servants, is a rich story with a lot of details and a lot of possibilities for sermonizing. I am trying to stay with one. It's placed here in the calendar of readings, near the end of the liturgical year and dovetailing into Advent, which is now only two weeks away, because like the story of the wise and foolish bridesmaids last week, it can clearly be used as a reminder to be prepared for the return of Christ and the judgments our creeds say will follow. And if we see God as that third slave did, harsh, angry, and merciless, this story certainly screams, get to work or else. After all, who wants to be thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? But what if the third servant's image of his master is wrong? After all, the other two servants aren't terrified of their master's wrath, even though he gives them much more than the more or less million dollars that he gives to the third one. The master obviously trusts all of these slaves a lot, enough to be gone a long time. Given how wealthy he was, he certainly could have found a way to take his wealth with him on his long journey if he had chosen to do so. And the master rejoices in the success of those first two slaves. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. Enter into the joy of your master. And when the third one comes forward and defensively gives his rationale for fearfully hiding the money in the ground, his master's response seems maybe at first to affirm the servant's characterization. 
You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow? But what if we are reading it wrong? What if the response is simply holding the slave accountable for his own words? Something more like this. If I were as harsh as you say I am, then you could have made some return on the money, and so your excuse still doesn't hold water. But that doesn't mean that the slave is right in his judgment about a master who would entrust millions of dollars to these slaves to use or invest as they see fit. What if the third slave's terror is misplaced, self-inflicted, based on a wrong understanding of who his master is and what he really wants? And what about us? Have you ever thought about somebody in a certain way until you see or hear something that sheds a whole new light on them, turning your previous impression on its head and challenging you to change your mind completely, to confess to God, or maybe even to apologize to that person for how you acted based on that wrong impression or incomplete information. I have to admit, admit that this sometimes happens to me. I get frustrated by something somebody says or does that I don't like, and I assume that it's just because they are just that way only to learn later that I had completely misunderstood their motives, which were actually wise and at least attempting to be helpful, or that I didn't know what was going on in other parts of their lives, which led them to act in ways that they usually wouldn't. The fact is that what we think we know about someone often governs how we interact with them, and the same is true with God. That is, if we imagine God primarily as stern or angry, waiting to hand out harsh justice for what we do or fail to do, then our relationship with God will be based on fear. And anything bad that happens to us must somehow be God punishing us. And if, on the other hand, we see God as one who doles out blessings and curses in some arbitrary and random fashion, then we are afraid even when good things happen, because the other shoe must be about to drop. Admit it, you probably have thought when things were going well, what's about to happen? I need to say here that as much as we might like to believe it when somebody hurts us, there really is not a Christian doctrine of karma, at least not in this life. But if we view God primarily in terms of grace, as the one who frees us and showers us with blessings and empowers us to use them fearlessly, if we will, then our eyes will be open to, aware of, and uplifted by the incredible number of gifts and moments of grace we experience all around us. Although we will still be surprised because God's goodness remains beyond our imagination. This is the God who so loved and loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to us, beginning as that helpless baby whose birth we will celebrate in just a few short weeks, to tell us and to show us how infinitely much God loves us. When we imagine God to be a God of love, we find it far easier to experience God's love in our own lives and to share it with others. But of course, because our image of God is influenced so much by the experiences and relationships we have known in life, changing that image can be hard sometimes, and it can take time. I can tell you without going into much detail that as I grew to adulthood, I really had to work with changing my image of God as someone who was a bit arbitrary and capricious, who would in one moment hand out candy and in the next moment hand out something very much different. But it is so worth the effort to get away from the idea that God's love for me is dependent on how good or successful I am. Sometimes I would tell my students the story we heard today, 
And then I would ask them this question, which I invite you to ponder. What do you think would have happened if one of the master's slaves, upon his return, had said to him, Master, I took the money that you gave me, I tried my best to trade with it, to invest it, to earn more with it, but I lost it all. I have nothing to show. What do you think the master would have said? I firmly believe that the master would have rejoiced just as much as he did for those first two slaves. Why? Because the master gave them those talents, that money, to use, not to bury in the ground. And what happened to it after that? Well, there are a lot of factors that determine whether we are successful or not in any part of our life. Some of those factors are attributable to us. Many of them are not. But nevertheless, God, who knows our hearts, knows our efforts, knows our desires, knows our motives. And if we are sincerely working and asking God to help us work, to earn, if you will, or to increase, is a better word, the love of God present in the world and present in and through our lives, then God is going to reward that. I don't know about you, but occasionally in my life, I have been uh, put into a relationship that was not reciprocal. I loved as much as I could. The person did not show love in return. I do not believe that God held that against me, even though I obviously failed in that relationship. Because God knew my heart, knew what I was trying to accomplish, knew what I was trying to do to share love and the fact that it was not reciprocated really wasn't on me. And at some point, as we know, Jesus tells stories about the need of his people try, upon trying to achieve a goal for God and it not being successful to wipe the dust off the feet and to move on to the next thing. I often used to say to my students, and you've heard me say it as well, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. God is love, and therefore God shows love 100%, 100% of the time. One of my better habits is that on most days, whether I'm working from home or on my way here, I pray the Office of Morning Prayer from our prayer book. Now, obviously, I don't read it if I'm on my way here. There is a great podcast of it called A Morning at the Office, which I'll be glad to share with you. It comes from our friends at Forward Movement. One of my favorite prayers in morning prayer in the prayer book, and it's also an evening prayer, is near the end, and it's called the General Thanksgiving. And this prayer reminds me a lot of today's story. Among other things, it's a reminder to me to see the God of love at work in our world and in the lives of those around me, as well as in my own life, and to do my best to be a part of God's work in any way I can. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And just after this, what I think is a beautiful prayer, to close the service, one of the closing sentences comes from the letter of the Ephesians, and it goes like this. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. 
Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen indeed. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. The day of the Lord is soon upon us, a day not of wrath, but of salvation. As children of the light and of the day, let us await the Lord's coming in prayer on behalf of the human family around the world, saying, O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for those who are not ready for the coming of the Lord, for the unbelieving, the skeptical, the scorners, that they may be brought to faith and rejoice to confess the name of the Lord. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for those who use their lips and lives to proclaim the good news for Christ's return, that they may persist in their zeal, empowered and emboldened through such, through the gifts of your spirit, particularly Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Daphne, our bishop, Steve, our priest, Lynn, our deacon, and all of the faithful of St. James' House of Prayer. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for those who with joy and longing await the return of the Messiah, that they may not grow weary in well-doing, but witness to the immediate and everlasting promise of our Holy Redeemer. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have Amen. mercy upon us. Let us pray for those who celebrate special days or special blessings, that they may share their joy with others, particularly Kevin Sneed, Mary Dunnigan, Deborah Head and Erica James as they celebrate birthdays. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for those whose lives, whose lives are marked by hunger and need, grief and loneliness, anger and strife, discord and uncertainty, that each may be assured of the grace and mercy of God. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for those who suffer affliction of any kind, that God, their constant companion and champion, may grant them healing and hope of life. 
especially those on our parish cycle of prayer. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have mercy on us. Let us pray for those who are prevented from praying with us, the persecuted and their persecutors, that each may be convinced of the good news of Jesus Christ and respond with faith and commitment. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have, have mercy, mercy on us. Let us pray for ourselves that the Spirit will ready us for the return of our Savior and King, that we may enjoy forever the exhilarating life awaiting the faithful in heaven. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for the departed, that they may enjoy eternally the nearer presence of Christ, especially Loretta Bradley, sister of Martin, Marvin Martin Sr. O oh God, for the sake of Christ, have, have mercy, mercy on us. Because you are God, you hear our prayers. Because you are merciful, you promise to answer. We commend to you, merciful God, ourselves and those for whom we pray, through the crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to greet one another with a sign of peace. Please be seated for just a moment. Just a reminder about um, communion and that folks will come up one row at a time as, as guided by the usher to receive, commun receive the bread here and to go back over there and back to your seat and not to consume the Blessed Sacrament until you have returned to your place since that involves um, removing your mask momentarily. I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, through the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We continue with the offertory hymn.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.